Hey, welcome to 2023. Bear with me here. I was uh, on five, six weeks of travel over in Europe and then came right back and went to the Winter uh, Winter Forge, a uh, warfare school out there in the mid-Missouri with SNS Training Solutions. I want to cover that on a different video, so enough about that. Uh, but it's good to be back. I uh, brought back with me just a bit of a chest cold. This time around, I thought it'd be cool to kick the year off with a strategic perspective video. I don't think I get enough of these, and so it's good to finally get back to one. And the topic is tanks. So in a previous video, we already explored whether or not, you know, uh, heavy infantry versus light infantry, uh, you know, and are tanks still relevant? I think that most of the experts conclude that they very much are, and I adhere to that to that idea. But that said, everybody's weighing in. It's not just the experts and the novices. We even have, um, you know, technological innovators such as Elon Musk weighing in on this topic. Um, and, and I do want to point out that I, um, it's not just for some sense of tradition or history that I say tanks are still relevant. Let me point out that, you know, scantily over a hundred years ago, tanks were presented on the battle space uh, to replace the obsolete cavalry, horse-mounted cavalry at the time. So at, at some point in time, there's no doubt in my mind that tanks will become obsolete and they'll be replaced by something else, just as they replaced, you know, horse cavalry and horse cavalry replaced chariots and, and on and on and on. I say that they continue to be relevant, um, not the least of which is because we have no viable replacement at this point. And if you talk to troops in training and on the battle, and particularly we're gaining a lot of insight um, from the regrettable war in Ukraine with Russia, but we're gaining insight on that. And I can tell you that um, the combatants, particularly the dismounted troops, the infantry, they don't want to move forward. They're all fine and well on a defense without tanks, but without tanks, they don't want to cross open terrain and take the fight to the enemy. So for these very reasons, I say yes, they are still relevant. And we could end this conversation right there, but I want to go farther than that because there's so much coming out of um, the Russian-Ukraine war that I think we need to address some of the narratives. And even before that, let me paint a picture for you strategically again. And that is that since World War II, the United States has been able to achieve not just air superiority, but one uh, capability above that, air dominance. Meaning we fly when we want to fly, where we want to fly, what we want to fly, and have almost no repercussion. By the Persian Gulf War, we saw that, you, know, you can argue it's slipped since, in the 30 years since, but at the Persian Gulf War, there was no question that we had created uh, maneuver dominance and specifically tank warfare. The Persian Gulf War 1991 in the Iraqi desert and the Kuwaiti desert. So we had, through technological advances, created an air dominance and a tank war dominance. Um, and that came from a couple of narratives that we really invested ourselves in in post-World War II, if not, in fact, during World War II itself. Let me, let me throw one narrative at you and then the other. I think you'll recognize them. Uh, the first narrative is this. Aircraft must be able to defeat enemy aircraft and suppress enemy air defenses in order to gain air dominance. Well, likewise, likewise. Tanks must be able to defeat enemy tanks and suppress enemy anti-armor systems in order to gain land dominance. I'm gonna present a different narrative that's counter to both of those two. Because yes, I accept those as axiomatic within a narrow bandwidth. However, I think the first narrative does not take into the reason why air dominance holds value. Why even gain air dominance if it's just air dominance for air dominance sake? We don't win wars by air, so why bother? And the second narrative doesn't take multiple things into uh, into account. For example, again, why do we want tank dominance? Tanks on their own don't win don't win wars. They don't win battles. Uh, and that's the problem in Ukraine right now is that tanks going ahead of their infantry, tanks going without uh, its supporting close air support and artillery are so incredibly vulnerable as to be nearly useless. So. Tank dominance in and of itself misses the point. 
So here's one of the archaic narratives, and I'm going to present two of those to kind of counter the first two rather modern narratives of air warfare and air dominance and tank warfare and tank dominance. Here's an archaic narrative. All branches of the military support the infantry. It is the infantry's job to close with the enemy, destroy the enemy, and then seize and hold their ground. That's what infantry do. And everything in the battle space, from ISR assets to special forces to tanks and to aircraft, it's all done in support of those guys in boots running around in the sand. That's an axiom. It's an archaic axiom. I'm not sure it's adhered to anymore. If you go back to 1914, you'd hear tanks are either male or female. Yeah, let's spend a moment with that one. In uh, World War I, that meant that a tank was either outfitted with exclusively machine guns, that was a female tank, and a male tank um, would have cannon, some kind of cannon. Those terms quickly fell out of favor, and not the least of which is because a tank is an offensive weapon. It, it can do defensive roles, let's get right to that. It certainly can, and under very specific circumstances, it can do those roles quite well. Um, under certain circumstances, let me tell you, the ground pounders, the infantry, you know, all of the ground troops, they really like having tanks embedded with their defense, but as a general rule of thumb, they're not great in the defense. They they have as many disadvantages as advantages, uh, not the least of which is they draw a lot of enemy fire. Enemy are concerned with tanks and want to knock them out. So because tanks are offensive, it wasn't like you could say, well, female tanks were defensive and male tanks were offensive. That's kind of a useless, you know, kind of dichotomy. It just, just doesn't ring true. Furthermore, as more and more tanks uh, received cannon um, and still retained machine gun, you know, the, the point of having machine gun only tanks seemed to, to be really gone by the earliest days of, you know, after the earliest days of the onset of World War II. We can look at those earliest days of World War II and we can say the French Char series tanks. The, uh, arguably the best tank in the world at its time. Meaning that it was big, it was heavy, uh, it had excellent armament for its day, and it had a excellent armor, so protection for its day, and just enough maneuverability, too, to keep up with the infantry. And this is, in fact, how the French tend to uh, distribute their tanks, was in direct infantry support. Whereas the British and the Germans quickly caught on to this and used it to great effect, um, the British and the Germans, particularly, said, well, I'm going to have whole tank formations so that they're this they had an incredible dynamic by punching through the enemy lines. Now, again, there's a misnomer there. They are tank formations. They still had their own infantry. They still had their own artillery. They still coordinated where and when possible for close air support. Remember the Stuka dive bombers and all of this stuff. So it was still a combined arms effort, very much so. But, um, you know, but it was notable uh, because it had these massed formations of panzers, right? So tanks. Um, and that actually served to overwhelm the formations of French tanks because they were spread so thin that they were actually, it's a defeat in detail. You can look at it from that, uh, you know, technologically juxtaposed against each other. The Germans simply had a defeat or uh, exhibited or conducted a defeat in detail uh, against the French tanks, even though the French tanks were better. And so we go, oh, okay. Blitzkrieg then ushers in this tank formation. And by the end of World War II, without anybody saying, you know, at that time, at the end of World War II, we're still saying light tank and medium tank and heavy tank. And the migration was towards a main battle tank, an MBT. And I don't know that this was ever a purposeful, like, okay, we're going to create this thing called a jack of all trades, a main battle tank. But nonetheless, that is where the technological advancement went up until its big heyday, its big Shangri-La, the, the proof of its concept comes in 1991 in the Persian Gulf War. We see that and it's a big payoff. And we go, yay, we all did the thing and we did the right thing. But I'm gonna say that the Persian Gulf War was an oddity. Hear me out. It's not the only war where tanks played a preeminent or predominant role. Oh, there are just a tiny 
handful of other examples. We could look at the Golan Heights of uh, you know, 1973, right? But the point is that they're so fleeting, they're so small. We look at warfare after warfare after warfare, and certainly armored formations, mechanized infantry, tanks play a role, but they don't play the leading role. They really didn't in Korea, definitely didn't in uh, Vietnam, though they both played a role there, and, and a decisive role under in some uh, battles and circumstances, but they weren't the, the leading branch, so to speak, right? It was still infantry, it was still artillery, it was still air power. So they just, they just really don't factor in the way that we pretend a main battle tank is going to factor in. It's going to knock out all the enemy's main battle tanks and punch a hole in their line, and then the infantry will swell in and, you know, close air support. Only the Vietnamese didn't have a lot of tanks. The Grenadians didn't have a lot of, the Panamanians didn't have a lot of tanks. We can keep going and going and going. The Iraqis and Afghanis, they didn't have a lot of tanks. And so, well, the Iraqis did in the Persian Gulf War, and maybe even again 12 years later when we re-entered in 2003 in Iraq, but those were quickly set aside. My point is that battle after battle after battle, tanks didn't really play a major role. And where they did in the Persian Gulf, it's an oddity simply because they did, but it's also an oddity for another reason. If Claims are to be believed, claims made by U.S. armed forces, you know, servicemen and women. U.S. tankers destroyed more enemy aircraft than the Allied aircraft, than Allied fighters and, and bombers and all this other stuff. No, no, no. What destroyed more enemy aircraft, the claim is, armored formations did. Tanks literally went up and down the line on airstrips and just blew them up. Um, and the vice uh, versa, the, the opposite is also true. So the claims are made, and these claims are very hard to verify, but I think that they're probably accurate enough. The claim is that um, the Allied air powers of the Persian Gulf War killed more enemy armored vehicles, tanks and APCs and that sort of thing, than tanks. So aircraft were critical in the Persian Gulf War, but maybe not um, their, their primary effect maybe wasn't as we think of it. And tanks were critical in the Persian Gulf War, but once again, maybe not every battle was 73 Easting. That really gets down to, gets down to what are tanks doing and what are their great threats. And in warfare, tanks more often than not are attacking infantry or soft-skinned vehicles, engineers, uh, artillery, anything directly supporting the infantry. That's where tanks are spending an inordinate amount of their munitions. So much so that you've certainly heard the discussion from World War II. The Sherman gunners didn't want to give up their 75s for the more powerful 76, even though the 76 was more effective against enemy tanks. The Sherman crew said, yeah, okay, that's great when I see one, but tomorrow morning I'm going into attack and I will be shooting enemy, um, you know, uh, infantry and enemy bunkers and enemy buildings and enemy vehicles. And I want thermobaric, the thermobaric effect of high explosive rounds that the 75 millimeter affords me in spite of the fact that the 76 millimeter was a better tank killer. The Sherman crews recognize a simple fact. They spent most of their time fighting infantry and their greatest danger wasn't enemy tanks, but enemy infantry, anti-tank guns, be it a Panzerfaust, a Panzer Schreck, a Pack 37 millimeter gun, you know, whatever it is. That was their greatest threat, and its second greatest threat was enemy aircraft, enemy fighters and bombers strafing them. This was the greatest threat to tanks in World War II, and this remains the greatest threat to tanks in the Russian-Ukrainian war. Tanks face infantry. Think of the in-laws and the javelins and the toes and all of, and the Milans. Heck, just RPG-7s pose a threat to tanks. So tanks face this threat and they fa face threat from the air. Yes, I do mean close air support, but heck, I even mean, you know, loitering munitions with drones and drones that have no munitions but can call in precision artillery fires on the tanks. So these are the greater threats to tanks. And you start to put that all together, maybe the idea of male and female tanks isn't so crazy after all. Or at least, maybe 
the formations of the Char series French tank in World War II, at the onset of World War II, isn't absolutely crazy. Maybe it's not one or the other. Do we have tanks that are primarily and, you know, or uniquely for infantry support? Well, as an infantryman, I could tell you that would be very welcomed because most of the tanks are geared up to kill tanks and they don't get that opportunity very often. So they're relatively useless as far as I'm concerned as an infantryman. Seriously. That's a harsh thing. I hold cavalrymen in very, very, and tankers in very, very high regard, but I gotta say their weapon is so geared up for one specific fight. One specific fight. It's like watching jousting, I think. If you're a pikeman, you know, a spearman in medieval times, and you're watching your knight go, watch how cool I can knock this other knight off this horse, and you're going, ah, it's absolutely useless for me in battle. That's a really cool trick. I'm impressed with your prowess, your bravery, and your technology, but that's useless to me in battle. And that's kind of how I feel about main battle tanks. Not entirely. It's an overstatement, and I'm making that over overstatement to make a point. I feel very much the same way about Gen 5 fighter aircraft. Not entirely, but for the most part, I'm thinking, wow, good for you. He must impress the women at the bars because I remain unimpressed as a ground pounder. How is that helping me do my job? Where I look up and I see an Apache or an A-10 and I'm like, yeah, right on. I know how close air, air support helps me. As the bigger picture is, without incredibly advanced fighter aircraft and interceptor aircraft, then close air support is left vulnerable to enemy. Uh, enemy air defense and enemy aircraft, enemy fighters. And without those fighter aircraft, I'm not getting resupplied. I'm not getting my meals, my water, my uh, fuel, my ammunition. I'm not getting my casualties evacuated. So the reality is that the air power is so very much bigger than just the fighter aircraft. It's that those fighter aircraft you know, fly cover for strategic bombers and strategic logistics and even close air support that pays huge dividends to the ground fighter. So I'm rather tolerant of, uh, you know, the latest, greatest generation of fighter and spending billions of dollars on this. I'm rather tolerant because I can see what that gets me in the battle space. Main battle tanks, Yes, I'm tolerant of them. Yes, I'm impressed by them. There are certain set of circumstances where their ability to come together in mass formations and punch through an enemy line is indeed advantageous to us all, to ending the war, to, you know, uh, tactical, operational, strategic victory. I get that, but uh, yeah, it, it just doesn't help me fight the fight I have in front of me. Whereas infantry supporting tanks would be incredibly welcomed, and they don't all need to look like a main battle tank. Maybe they're light tanks. Maybe they're wheeled tanks. Maybe they're, I, I don't know. I mean, there's so many different things we can look at. You know, striker vehicles, we're looking at this as a possibility. I think that there's room for male, female tanks, offense, defense tanks, or infantry support and cavalry formation tanks. That's where I'm inclined to believe the information we're seeing come out of the most recent wars. And we can say wars, not war, because, you know, we've had Iraq and Afghanistan and Syria, um, in addition to uh, wars, more recent wars that took place in Georgia and now in Ukraine. We can look at all of those and we can start to say, yeah, um, it's not that tanks are irrelevant. They're still very relevant because there's nothing to take its place. At the same time, I guess I'll posit this as a theory, and that is we need to rethink the role of tanks and how we might diversify those much in the same way that air power is diversified. Not just fighter aircraft, but close air support. And not just close air support, but logistical support. And not just logistical support, but strategic bombing of enemy assets. Maybe we can look at tanks in that regard as well. Thanks for joining me. More on this later, I promise, okay?